tonight, if you look with me in the Word of God, we want to continue uh, from what we started last week, a four-part series on talking about a priest at God's altar. We're using uh, Exodus chapter 29 for our basis of thinking tonight. And simply by way of review, if we will, remind you that God prepared the nation of Israel that they might be a kingdom of priests unto God, that they might be a holy nation. But because of their idolatry, because of their sin, uh, because of all that they did, they pushed God away. And the fact of the matter is, God's plan did not falter, but the nation of Israel, Israel faltered in God's plan. And therefore, because of the sins they committed and the things of rebellion they went through, uh, they lost the privileges that God had given to them. And now those privileges have fallen upon the church, and we now enjoy those privileges that they lost. You will recall that the Bible tells us that we are a chosen generation. Uh, we are a kingdom of priests. We are a holy nation. We are a peculiar people. And the fact that we have been called out of darkness and transformed into the marvelous light of the Almighty God. So those privileges have now fallen upon uh, the church today. In the Old Testament, God had a priesthood for the believer, but today we the believer have become the priesthood unto God. And I think that's something we need to understand. If you are born again, if you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are a priest unto God. And many times when we think about being a priest unto God, we think that's no big deal. Does that mean I wear uh, what the Roman Catholic priests wear? Do I wear what the Orthodox rabbi wear? Do I put on that, 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 that uniform? That con No, that's not what it means at all. And I believe as we get further into the study, I hope that you will appreciate what it means that you are a priest unto the Almighty God. Now last week we looked at the process of what it meant to become a priest unto God. And the, the, the process is illustrated in the Old Testament ceremony of the induction of Aaron and his sons into the priesthood. Uh, the same steps involved with Aaron and his sons are the same steps that places you and me uh, into the priesthood of the Almighty God. Now, first of all, they were chosen and they were called of God. I'll not take the time to read it, but last week we talked about it in Exodus 29, uh, 1 through 3. You recall you had to be born into the right family in order to be a priest. Uh, you had to be born into the family of Aaron. If you were not born into Aaron's family, I don't care how smart you were, how intellectual you were, how educated you were, how much money you had, how much talent you had. If you were not born into the family of Aaron, you would not become a priest. You had to be born into uh, the right family. By the same token, uh, we have got to be born into the right family. Being a Davis was not the right family. Uh, uh, being a Ramsey was not the right family. Being a Baal was not the right family. Uh, what's the right family is when we are born again. For as many that are called upon him, he will no wise cast us out. And to as many that call upon him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. So there's a lot more people in the world might be smarter than me and you. They might have more gifts than you and I have. They may have more charisma than we have. But the fact that we are born again, that puts us in the family that we now are priest unto the Almighty God. Secondly, they were washed. Read about that in Exodus uh, chapter uh, 20, uh, uh, 29 and verse 4, I believe it was. They were washed. Remember, they took the blood of the sacrifice. They applied it to the right earlobe. They applied it to the right thumb. And they applied it to the right big toe. It said that the nation of Israel that were priests, they would listen and hear to the word of God. They would work for the Almighty God and they would walk in his steps. In other words, their entire body had been washed, which is a picture of salvation, if you will. They, they were exclusively given over uh, to the work and the ministry of the Almighty God. We have been washed, thank God. Uh, we have not been redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ the Lord. We have been washed in in the blood of the Lord tonight, cleansed of our sins, and now we are to maintain a life of holiness. Wholeness is not what we put on. Wholeness is what comes out of our heart. A lot of times you can paint the outside of the building. A lot of times you can dress up the outside, but if the inside is wrong, it's going to corrupt what's on the outside. Wholeness is not what we wear or don't wear. Wholeness is a matter of the heart. And when the Lord cleanses us from our sin and the Lord Lord comes into our heart, then we will live the 
a life that will bring glory and honor to his name and will act like priests in this crazy world. Th thirdly, they were clothed in Exodus 29, 5 through 9. God told Moses to make special uh, garments for Aaron and his sons. Let me read that to you, if I may, in Exodus chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28, 42. I want to read this tonight. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness, from the loins even to the thighs they shall reach. And they shall call upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come into the tabernacle of the congregation, or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him. They were to wear the right clothes to minister before God. If they ministered and did not have on the right clothes as they went into the holy place, as they went into the holy of holies, they would die. Yes. I remind you that as Christians, God does not make us righteous. He simply declares us righteous. The righteousness that we have is in Jesus Christ. When he sees you, when he sees me, he sees us through the sanctifying power of the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Yes. He that make us that way, he declares us righteous. That, my friend, is a legal term. We must wear the robe of righteousness in order to do the works of righteousness. Uh, finally, number four, they were anointed in Exodus 29, 7. The priest carried an anointing upon them that tells me they could do what other people could not do because they had the unction, they had the ability that came totally from God. Let me tell you something. We have an anointing upon us that the Holy Spirit has placed upon us that's second to none. Amen. And if you and I would walk in the anointing and walk in the righteousness of God, it's a sight what we could do for the Lord in this world we live. As a priest, we represent God to the world and we represent the world to God. Amen. Let the anointing of the Lord rest upon us. And then notice finally, they were satisfied, Exodus 29, 22 through 37. They were set apart for God's exclusive service. In other words, he fed them some of the sacrifices. He met every need that they had as priests unto God. Now that's how we're called into the priesthood. The same steps that God did to Aaron and his sons. I hope you see the spiritual application. That's the same way that God calls us. Now that we're priests, what big deal. What does that mean? What are the privileges that we have as a priest? Remember, the nation of Israel, they lost the privileges of being a priest unto God. Remember, to the priest, they offered up strange fire before the Lord and he killed them. Remember that? He killed him because of strange fire that was offered up before the Lord. So we have an awesome responsibility. Tonight, let's look at the privileges, ministering as a priest. Again, we'll look at the Old Testament ceremony of Aaron. And we'll see here uh, the fact, uh, uh, how they correlate to us today. Now, Aaron and his descendants, they enjoyed some special privileges as priests unto God that no one else in the nation of Israel was able to enjoy. God had set them apart to do special things that nobody else in, the, in Israel could do. Uh, the prophets couldn't do it. The kings couldn't do it. The fancy leaders couldn't do it. The generals in the army couldn't do it. Only the priests were allowed to do certain things in there. Aaron and his sons enjoyed those privileges that were forbidden by everybody else in the land to do. Each of these privileges can correlate to a special way to you and me as New Testament believers today. First of all, they cared for God's dwelling place in Numbers chapter 3. Each of the three families, if you will, had a specific area of ministry that they were to perform. Uh, notice, if you will, they were in complete charge of the tabernacle, and each family was assigned a specific and a special ministry opportunity that no one else could do. We find about the Gershonites. They cared for the tabernacle coverings and the hangings. The Goatites, they were in charge of the furniture and the vessels. And then the family of Merarah, uh, they supervised the tabernacle structure, the boards, uh, the pillars, the bars, and all the other equipment. Those three families took care of everything in the temple, or the tabernacle rather. That was God's dwelling place upon the earth. Why? It was all carefully organized like clockwork. Every time they moved that tabernacle, it was like clockwork. They knew what to do. Everybody had something to do. Lock, stock, and barrel. It was like a machine doing their job. Why? Because it had to be handled meticulously because it was God's dwelling place. Correlate that to New Testament, you and I as kings and priests.
What is or where is God's dwelling place today? God doesn't dwell in this building. God doesn't dwell in brick and mortar. God doesn't dwell in some of these fancy uh, synagogues and some of these fancy churches and some of these fancy churches made of gold. I mean, million dollar. God doesn't dwell there. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. We are here, God's temple, God's people gathered. When we leave, we'll be God's people scattered. But right now, the Lord wasn't in this building. We brought him with us when we came into this building. So we are priests unto God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The individual believer is a temple. The church local is a temple when we get there. And the universal church is a temple of the Holy Spirit of God. I remind you today, God dwells in his people. Not like the Old Testament where God dwelt among his people. Think about this. God dwells in his people. In the Old Testament, God dwelt among his people. Under the Old Testament, God made the people to have a sanctuary. But today, we his people are his sanctuary. We are the sanctuary. I may feel like a small chapel to you, but I'm a sanctuary under the Lord just as you are this evening. That means that we as believer priests have the wonderful privilege of caring carefully for God's dwelling place. Think about that. This begins with the care of our own bodies as the temple of God. As a Christian, we should no more want to defile this body than a Jew would want to defile the temple or the tabernacle of the Old Testament. Think about this. God created the body. Jesus redeemed it. And the Holy Ghost lives in it. Amen. This body is a tool. This body is a temple. This body is a treasury house. This body is a tempting ground. How do we defile the dwelling place of God? Fornication for one thing. Alcohol abuse, drug abuse. Smoking or chewing. Somebody with smoking in your hill? I don't know. Make you smell like you've been there and back. I don't know. I'm not the judge. But what do we do to defile the temple of the Almighty God? It affects us emotionally, leading to slavery. You may not tonight, for, you, you may tonight, I uh, may forget your sin, but the sins that we commit will not forget us. And it's important that we defile not the temple. Know ye not, ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And one of the ways for sure we know is fornication. And you know, we live in the day today where the world is full of fornicators. I'm not judging, I'm being honest. And you know, fornication creeps into the church and people today say, well, it don't matter. It just doesn't matter. It does matter to God. It does matter to God. Church, I'm telling you, we are in an all that battle tonight to maintain wholeness unto God. Yes. And a lot of people say, I can't be holy, so I'm just going to give up. Don't give up. Give in to God and let him have his way in your life. Care for our body. He's the temple. We're the temple. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our body as a living sacrifice unto God. One of, the, one of the responsibilities we have is caring for this body. Secondly, another responsibility is keeping the fire burning. In Leviticus 6.12 we read, And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, it shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order upon it, and he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offering. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. When Moses and Aaron dedicated the temple, the fire of God came down out of heaven. It consumed the sacrifice on the brazen altar. It was the responsibility of the priests of the Old Testament to go in every morning and remove the ashes from the sacrifice and in the evening pre put on fresh wood in order that the fire may continue to burn. If the fire was not burning on the altar, there would never be a sacrifice offered up to God. Are you hearing me? 
Why do you find and why do I find many times our sacrifice of praise to be difficult? Why do we find our sacrifice of worship to be difficult? Why do we find our sacrifice of giving our money to be difficult? Why do we find the sacrifice of our soul witnessing to be hard? Because the fire is not burning. And more times than not, what we do, we do out of rote habit. We do because we're guilty. We do because we think it's something we're supposed to do. But friend, when the fire is burning upon the altar, whatever sacrifice I put on it, it goes up in smoke quickly. But if I, all that's there is ashes, what we do, we're doing sometimes in our own strength, our own power, and in our own ingenuity. It's responsibility. Without the fire on the altar, the people can offer the sacrifice to God. All this has a spiritual application to the Christian. And here it is. Each of us have a spiritual temperature. What is your spiritual temperature? What is mine? We all have a spiritual temperature. And if we do not keep fire burning upon the altar, we're going to be cold. If we have a little, bit of, a little bit of ashes there that's burning just a little bit, we'll be lukewarm. But if the fire is red hot, we'll be on fire for God. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm just telling you something today that I think we all struggle with, we'll be honest. And that is the fact the fire on the altar is burning dim. It's the tendency of fire to go out if we do not keep it going. In 2 Timothy 2 and 2 Timothy 1 6, Paul told Timothy to stir up the gift of God, which literally means put life into the fire again. Put life into the fire again. The New International Version says, fan into full flame. The Living Bible says, stir into flame. Again, it's the tendency of fire to go out if we simply don't put wood upon it. I don't know about you. I'm just talking to myself. It's so easy to live off of yesterday's experience that we forget to have an up-to-date experience with God today. It's so easy to live off the revival of yesteryears, to live off the touch that God gave us around the altar last month. It's so easy uh, when we were slain the Spirit two years ago to live off of that. But I'm going to tell you, every morning the high priest went in and got rid of the ashes of that day. And that evening put fresh fire upon the altar. There's got to come a place in your life and mine where we are disciplined enough and concerned, and I'm speaking to the choir tonight, and concerned enough to say every morning, God, I'm back again. I thank you for what happened yesterday. I thank you for the touch of God yesterday. But that's yesterday is in the tomb, buried. Tomorrow is in the womb, no promise. But today's the day the Lord hath made. And that's why they call it a present, because it's a gift from God. And therefore, we're back again today to get rid of those old ashes and go back tonight. God put fresh wood up on the altar. I can't afford, you cannot afford to live off the ashes of yesterday. And this is where Pentecostal churches in America, many of them are today and around the world. We're living off the ashes of yesterday's revival. We're living off the smoke of yesterday's revival. We're, we're riding on the coattails of the theology and the coattails of great preachers and prophets of years gone by. But oh God, I want the fresh fire of God to fall today Amen. upon me. It'll never fall until we take out the ashes and put the fresh wood upon that altar for the Lord to come and burn within us. Daily we must add fresh fuel and then ask the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, to blow upon the fire and bring the blaze into full glory for God. I don't want to be lukewarm and yet I fight it. How about you? I don't want to be cold and yet I fight it. How about you? It's hard to keep the fire burning in this hour in which we live. I'm just being honest with you. Yeah. I've got to make myself study the Word of God. i got to make myself pray. Amen. Well, you're a preacher. We pay you. Hey, I'm out of the same stuff as you are. It's a constant battle. And the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the more the devil wants to rob, kill, destroy, and beat us down. But if we'll say, God, I'm a priest unto you. I'm going into the holy place. And take away those ashes of yesterday and put the fresh wood upon him. So I may burn for the glory of God. Neglecting the fire. And it gets low, and we become lukewarm Christians, or even cold Christians. And we no longer belong to a church of the living God. We belong to the church of the first frigid air. And we can say, many are cold and few are frozen, but God, thaw me out for the glory of God. 
The third thing and third privilege we have as a priest unto God is washing at the laver. Again in Exodus chapter 30, 17. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Ye shall also make a basin of bronze with its base of bronze for washing, and ye shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and ye shall put water in it. Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet from it. When they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water, so that they do not die. Or when they have, do you get that? So that you hear a lot about death in the priesthood, don't you? Think about that. You hear a lot about death in the priesthood. God takes this thing serious. So that they do not die, or when they approach the altar to minister, by offering up in smoke a fire, sacrifice the Lord, so they shall wash their hands and their feet, so they do not die. And it shall be permanent statue for them, for Aaron and his descendants throughout their generation. When the priests served in the tabernacle and or the temple, their hands and their feet got dirty. Just as God did not want another priest to have on dirty clothes, they were washed initially head to toe, which is symbolic of salvation. But as we labor, as we work in this world, we're going to get dirty. So he says to come and be able to, 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 to wash. Here we find God commanding them to wash their hands and feet at the brazen labor in the holy place. If they did not wash, again, this is symbolic of sanctification daily. If they did not wash daily, they could stand in danger of death. We are in this world, but hopefully the world is not in us. We are in this world, but we are not of the world. We have temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil every day of our life. We sometimes, we smell like the world. We, we, we can't help but listen to the world's jokes and, and see the world's commercials and, and the world's literature. It's there. I mean, you're looking for it. It slaps you right in the face when you're not even looking for it. So we come before God daily and we ask him to wash us afresh and anew in the blood of Christ. And God forbid, but if we sin, and there's not a sinless one among us, but if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous, who is the propitiation of our sins and ours only, but the sins of the entire world. We can come before him every morning, God, and every night, oh God, wash me in your holy blood. Yes, Lord. I live among people of unclean lips. And inside me, God, dwelleth no good thing, and stuff can slip out of me, and thoughts can enter into me. Wash me, sanctify me all over again, God. Put me under the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. The same principle applies to we as believers, priests today. If we want to have fellowship with the Lord, we must come to Him daily for cleansing. Amen. Again, when they took the blood upon the earlobe, the thumb, and the right toe, that was symbolic of salvation. But we come back every day for cleansing, which speaks of sanctification. What's that? We're set apart from sin, and we're set apart to the service of God. I believe you'll never be any cleaner than the day of the blood of Christ, God's Son, cleansed you from sin. But we grow in sanctification every day. We grow in sanctification every day. The priest washed all over initial ordination. Picture salvation. But they needed their regular cleansing, which is a picture of daily sanctification. Another responsibility that we have, first of all, we talked about uh, caring for God's dwelling place, this temple, keeping the fire burning on the altar of our heart, washing at the laver. And now the fourth thing, responsibility, is burning the incense. We sing that song here sometime, let incense arise. What's that all about? Let our prayers arise to God. There were two altars at God's sanctuary, a brazen altar which stood at the door and was used for blood sacrifice. But there was a golden altar that stood before the veil and it was used for burning incense. Two altars, the brazen altar for sacrifice and the golden altar that stood before the veil. The golden altar pictures the offering of prayer to the Lord. In Psalm 141, Lord, I call upon you. Hurry to me. Listen to my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be counted as incense before you. The raising of my hand as the evening offering. Set a guard, Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. God speaks to us in prayer. Prayer is not meant to be a monologue when we come to God and giving Him our wish list, prayer is a dialogue where He communes with us. Yes. 
And too many times, I'm, I'm being honest, if you agree with me, it's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. But what I see in Christianity through the years has been, let's go and tell God everything that we want. I'm guilty, are you? Amen. But we need to have those quiet moments where we stop and wait upon Him, where He speaks to us. We have a great example of that uh, in the Word of God in Luke. You recall in Luke 1, 5 through 17, Lot came up for Zacharias to go in uh, to the temple. They waited and waited and waited, hoping that one day they'd get to do that. And his lot showed up, and he got to go in uh, there for the burning of incense, typifying the saints, a prayer of saints. And as it went up, the angel appeared to him and told him that his prayers had been heard and God was going to do a great thing that his wife in her old, older year was going to become pregnant and have a baby called John. He'd be a forerunner to Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing how the man prayed and doubted what he heard? He doubted it. How can this be? She's old, I'm old. How? So he, he, what happened? Couldn't speak another word. He could not speak another word simply because he doubted the will of God. But it was there at that incense, that altar of incense where he prayed, that God heard. How many times do we pray and we hope God, be honest with me, by show of hands, how many times do we pray and we hope God hears us? Am I, okay, let's be honest. How many times do we pray and we think He hears us? How many times do we pray and we're just not sure He even cares? My hand's up, I don't know about you, I'm being honest with you. But it hit me this morning. Who do you think you're talking to? Yeah. Huh. I, I woke up early this morning, took off up here, and I'm praying. And it's almost like God said, who do you think you're talking to? Well, God, it's you. Well, what does that mean? He can do anything. God is awesome in power, awesome in glory. He created everything that's in this world. He holds the world in the palm of his hand. He can measure the ocean of the world in the palm of his hand. I mean, God is so big, his center is nowhere, and his circumference is everywhere. Who is it you think we're going to in prayer? Which tells me that I don't frequent the altar of incense enough if I don't understand and comprehend the width, the breadth, and the love, and the depth of this God that I'm talking to. Does that make sense? Yes. God, take me as a priest into that holier place, which will one day lead me to the holy of holies, that I may commune with the almighty God. And the, the, the will of God is his word. And we can read that word and we can understand that word to know who he is and all that he wants. So when we come before him in prayer, it's not I hope he hears, I think he hears, but we know he hears. But then at the altar of incense, we wait long enough for him to speak to us. What a privilege it is to pray to the Father and to know who it is that we truly are speaking to. Believers in this present age, we have a greater privilege than the priests of the Old Testament because we are invited to come boldly into the holy of all holies because when Jesus died, the veil that separated was bursted out and we can go in, we can live beyond the veil. It's just not frequent. We can live in the veil. Amen. But yet, I can't speak for you. But I'm yet to grasp what that really means. I, I'm yet to, I mean, I get, I get nuggets of it sometimes. But to know that the high priest went into that holy of holies once a year with a rope tied around him, knowing that if he didn't do everything exactly right, he would be die. He would die. And they had to pull him out. And their sins were before him for another year. But if he did everything right, they'd pull that holy curtain back and he'd walk in in fear and trepidation before the holy God. Dear God, give me that kind of a holy fear to my holy God. Because American Christians, they many of us, we think he's the man upstairs, he's daddy, he's the guy in the sky. We have lost so much respect for the holy God who has power to snap life and power to snap death at any moment. 
But it's in that Holy of Holies where we can take time to be holy and have the Holy Spirit lead us and the Holy Word of God to teach us and the Holy God up on the throne that can speak to us. Who is this God that we're talking to? He's not a man that he lie, nor the son of man that he repent. He bids us to come into the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God, and present our petitions before him. There's a lot of people I'd like to be able to present petitions to for. I'd like to go down to the county right about now and present a lot of things to some of those folk. To be honest with you, I don't mean that ugly. My wife's not in here, and if you don't tell her, she won't know this, but if she finds out, I'm in trouble. I went down to the county office one day, been a few years ago, and I said, I walked in, and that place was packed with contractors. I walked in, I said, the woman said, can I help you? I said, I've come to speak to the horse's mouth. Is that you? That's me. I said, you've been called into the Department of Animals Anatomy lately? And she laughed, and I'm glad they all laughed, because that's the way I felt about them. moment. Forgive me for that. But the truth of the matter is, I can't have an appointment with some of these people because I don't know them. I can't have an appointment with, uh, with, with our governor. I can't have an appointment with our senators. I can call up and get somebody that represents them who's supposed to represent me. But you and I have the privilege of going before the Almighty God daily to present our petitions. But let's be honest. Can we just go ahead and dig a little deeper? How many times do we go with a mindset we have the privilege of entering and we know who it is that sits on the throne but when we get there we think but he's not going to do nothing. Because our experience said he hadn't done much in the past because we haven't let him do it. We've walked ourselves out of it. We've talked ourselves Whatever the case may be. I'm going to tell you, we need to be like the woman in the Bible. She kept on knocking and kept on knocking and kept on knocking and kept on knocking and kept on knocking. Just kept on pestering the man until the open door said, give her what she wants. What, in other words, it was her importunity. It wasn't he was stingy. It's just the fact she's making a demand upon my ability. And God is basically saying, let's make a demand upon his ability. We have the privilege of entering into the Holy of Holies as a priest unto God. When Jesus died on the cross, that veil in the temple was torn in two. And because of that, God made up, opened up a way. Now, a living way for you and for me. Have you ever been around incense when it's burning? Does it give off, does it give off an aroma? Some incense stinks and some smells good. My wife's got a few little candles that different things and they heat up and puts out a, an aroma. You be around it, you can smell it. I'll guarantee you when the priest came out of the holy place around that altar of incense, people, they could smell, oh, you've been talking to the Lord. You've been in the temple. Do you think that we can be in such the presence of God that people can take knowledge that we have been with Jesus? They said of their early disciples, did they not? And they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. There was no sign that said they'd been with Jesus. They didn't stamp their hands and I've been to church with Jesus. But the way they lived, the way they talked, the way they acted, and the way they ministered, and the way they witnessed, testified to the fact they've been with Jesus. I had a situation happen several months ago. I won't go into the details. But it broke my heart. Someone inflicted severe pain upon themselves. Someone that I knew. Someone that I cared for. I thought to myself, before that person did that, why did they not call me? I thought we had that kind of relationship. Why did they not call me? Then I thought about the scripture of the Old Testament. Let's go to the city and call upon this man. Perhaps he can show us the way. When people take knowledge that you and I have been with Jesus, maybe people will call us and we can help them out of hell they may be going to or help them out of the hell they're living in. There are many people that I know tonight when my back's against the wall, who do you call? Who do I call? The first person I want to call is somebody that I know, that I know, has been in the presence of God. Yeah. 
And if I can get a hold of that person that can get a hold of God, that's who I'm going for. I'm not looking to dear Abby, and I'm not going to judge Judy, and I'm not going to the world, but I want to call upon God myself and get hold of somebody that knows how to get hold of God. Yeah. I shared this years ago that comes to mind right now. How many of you remember the Ratcliffe, Ratcliffe bus wreck in Kentucky many years ago where that drunk driver hit that 66 passenger bus, killed a lot of the children and some of the adult workers? At that time, President Ronald Reagan called Brother and Sister Tennyson, the pastor of that Assembly of God church, and said, Nancy and I are praying for you. Anything you need, let us know, and we'll have it there. Some hours or days later, George Herbert Bush called. Sister Tennyson, Barbara and I are praying for you. If there is anything that you need by way of federal government or assistance, you let us know, and we will have it there for you. And she thanked them. Now, while that meant a lot, it didn't help her. But the dare so lady, an old mother of Israel, an old prayer warrior called her up. She said, Sister Tennyson, I've been before the throne of God today praying for you and your family and your church. And God wants me to give you a word. I don't know about you, friend. I want that woman in my corner. Amen. And the world is looking for somebody like that in you and me that we might be in their corner. Take knowledge that we have been with the Lord. As we pray, there should be a spiritual fragrance in our lives that others know that we've been with Jesus. Martin Luther said, We're all priests, and our praying is the burning of incense. People knowing that we have been with the Lord. I hope you see something. We'll continue this next week. But I hope that you'll see the importance of what it means to be a priest. It's not just something that we say we are. Friend, there's a privilege we have of being a priest unto God. Yeah.